A lot of people on Twitter have been sending me a question related to the event we hosted a couple of weeks ago. For those of you who don't know, the Clan Eat casting crew hosts a monthly show match series known as the Meat Grinder, which you can check out by simply clicking... Let's go with here. This latest event was Bunny vs. Hydra, and most people counted Bunny out. The games were a close best of seven, going all the way to the river match, and both players showed why they are considered top tier. But one thing players noticed, and I even commented on in the cast, was that Bunny had two very distinct styles, and while one seemed indomitable, the other had clear weaknesses. One of those styles, the successful one, was the tried and true Reaper Hellion expand, and that is what the question on Twitter centered around. Why is that build so strong? Why is that most other options for the Terran result in disaster? And why does Shaft always talk about map control? Well, the goal of today's lesson will be to answer all of those questions in extreme detail. This video is my very first solo endeavor aimed at Terran, so please be gentle. Also, Zerg buddies who watch this video should still learn a lot about aspects of this matchup that maybe they haven't considered before. I want to begin with an example of what Reaper Hellion Expand should look like. For your typical Reaper Expand, you want to begin your barracks at 11 supply and your gas at 12. Time it out so that the moment your barracks completes, you have exactly 50 gas for the Reaper. Depending on map length and the build order execution of the Terran player, the Reaper should arrive between 3.45 and 4 minutes. Here we see Bunny a bit delayed and the Lings are already in position. Once the Lings are out, this skirmish becomes a dance. The Reaper must venture onto creep to poke at the drones, but the Zerglings are there to chase it back. The Zerglings cannot move off of creep lest they are kited to death by the Reapers, so the Reaper is free to heal up and repeat the cycle. Whether drones are killed or not, this will hurt the Zerg opponent simply because it forces Zerglings. The Queen functions as a launching pad for the Zerg. You can't kite versus them in equal numbers. One queen beats one reaper, but two reapers beats one queen. Luckily for our Terran buddies, it takes so long to make a queen. While it can be tempting to overmake reapers here, we will later discuss how that affects your mid game, so be mindful. Reapers rule the map until 6 minutes, when metabolic boost typically completes. With fast ling speed usually comes a fast third base, so that's the target of this attack. Notice that the speedlings immediately took the watchtower? Reapers lose that to speedlings, who will soon lose it to hellions, but even momentary control is worth it. The queens come down the ramp, the stable portion of the zerg army. The lings come from behind, utilizing overlord positioning as well as control of the tower to predict where the Terran will be. This is a great tactic, even though it doesn't work exactly as planned here. This is a fairly typical, if not ideal, TVZ scenario. Now that you are familiar with the general structure, we need to delve into the nooks and crannies, the hows and whys of the situation. Before we do that, though, Here's a word from our sponsors. If the only tool you have is a hammer, then every problem looks like a nail. It's time to start using the right tool for the job. Introducing SC2ReplayStats.com. They have the best replay parser out there with thousands of uploads whose build orders and timings are stored to help you find out how you stack up against others in your division. Or if you're a data nerd like me, analyze your favorite pros games so you can be awesome too. After all, how do you think Crash Course got started? My favorite feature is hands down the training center. It's got all the most important statistics like when to get your third, how many drones to make, and even how badly you're missing in. They explain key focus points individualized to your matches and play style that will help you get to that next level. For only $5 a month, SC2 Replay Stats is more than worth it. Go thank them for supporting esports by getting better today. The number of Reapers players choose to get is usually player and strategy dependent. 
More Reapers equates into more early game map control, but a delayed mid game. It is important to remember that every edge gained comes at a cost. In a different game, Bunny chooses to only use one Reaper and doesn't do a proper follow up with the Hellions, electing instead to gain more Marines faster. Bunny ends up getting some Hellions later, but misses the timing window where they would be effective and hence loses them to Roach Ling. With no ability to hold map control, little AoE in the form of Widow Mines, and no SimCity at the third, Bunny falls epically. A lot of players are tempted to get some kind of damage compensation from their Hellions. This is why players will so often sacrifice them prematurely on a drone line, which then hurts the Terran when he goes to take a third, or punish creep spread. Map control is its own reward, irrelevant to cost. Even Bunny occasionally falls victim to this, as we see in game 1, where he gets a huge drone pull with some good kills, but still loses map control immediately after. Due to how much damage he did with this attack, he is able to take his third and force Hydra to commit heavily to punishing it. Hellions are great for map control, and keeping the amount of creep spread low. At a certain point though, they become insufficient, and this is typically when the Mutalisks arrive. After the Mutalisks appear on the map, it is going to be up to forward Marines to take out creep, and this is most often done between 12 and 13 minutes. Sometimes though, the Terran army is too small or too much is left at home. The only time either of these possibilities occur are when the Terran has done something wrong earlier in the game and is being punished for it. It's now time to delve a bit more into this aspect of Bunny's play. The first thing that sticks out with this form of ZVT is that there is no Reaper early game. It seems obvious, but it has huge repercussions throughout the rest of the game. The Zerg is free, once he realizes this, to do what he wants. Most often, the Zerg will assume met as those early marines are often used to hunt overlords, denying scouting information, and that is prototypical mech style. If one is going to do this and goes mech, that's fine. Bunny, however, likes to follow it up with bio, and that is a can of worms that must be looked into. In the games we are going to look at now, Hydra chooses to push forward around 8 minutes with a small number of roaches. This serves a few purposes, but most importantly, it serves to scout what the Terran is up to. At this point, he could be doing a Hellbat timing, he could be hiding Hellions in order to catch the Zerg unprepared, he could be going Mech, or any number of other things. Pretty much anything the Terran could do is punished by the Zerg's roaches at this point even Banshee, which would be delayed for defensive purposes. A lot of Zerg players are scared to do small attacks, because those are drones not made. If a Zerg wants to attack, they all in. There is very little in between. But Hydra shows a great example of Zerg using a small attack to gain more information and later punish the Terran with it. The reasons Bunny tries to skip the mid-game portion of this Terran strategy is manyfold. The primary reason is that Terrans these days are used to being super greedy, taking low ground CCs way sooner than they should. Bunny definitely did that a few times and was punished for it in the series. Skipping the mid-game portion to get faster upgrades, stem pack, and marine production, Bunny is hoping that he will not get attacked too aggressively. Zerg often play passive, never committing to an engagement, especially an attack, with less than an amount necessary for certain victory. This usually means never attacking into a Terran natural, but in some circumstances where greed is a factor, that is exactly what a Zerg should do. In short, Bunny is gambling. If he can survive the mid game long enough to begin implementing drops, he is in a golden position. He feels comfortable in his multitasking and he's not too scared of mutalisks, as his marine upgrades and production were started super early. Drops force mutas, and if he has already got the counter to those mutalisks, 
he's in a great spot. The central problem with this strategy is a strained ability to take a third, and it is not a problem that I believe has been solved yet. In summary, I think the standard TVZ is the best out there right now in terms of bio. Mech is its own game which I'm not commenting on right now, but if you like bio, Reaper Hellion is required. The best TVZ action doesn't come from overall strategy, but rather the execution of each phase of the game and understanding behind those phases. Reaper Hellion harassment is a must, especially at that critical 7 minute mark. The goal is to delay drones if you cannot kill them and eliminate creep spread. Once a third is taken, you can temporarily give map control back while you transition into a marine mine composition with medevac support and establish that third. At this point, it's time to hunt creep and drop exposed bases. Try to find a weakness or hole in their base and force that baby open. Hold the central location on the map while dropping. This applies pressure to forward zerg bases, which you can poke into while dropping. Dropping from a center point makes it easy to hit two locations simultaneously without being scouted. This three-point offense allows planetary fortresses to be established in a defensive perimeter with missile turret support and then the ultra late game can begin. Push my button man, push my button man, do it, do it, you know you want to, do it, do it.